This is Kathy Knipfer, instructor for Nursing 2203, Care of Children, recording the pediatric lecture for Chapter 47, entitled Integumentary Dysfunction. Skin lesions can be caused by contact with injurious agents, hereditary factors, external factors that produce a reaction in the skin, such as from allergens, systemic disease in which lesions are a manifestation of that disease. Examples would be measles, lupus, or nutritional deficiencies. Let's talk about some examples of age-related skin manifestations. Infants, we would see birthmarks. In early childhood, we often see atopic dermatitis. We often see ringworm with school-age children and acne with adolescents. We also should remember that anxiety may produce or prolong or modify skin conditions. Types of lesions might include erythema, ecchymoses or bruises, petechiae. The primary lesions may be macules, papules, or vesicles, and then secondary lesions can develop from the rubbing and scratching. We can also describe a distribution pattern such as being localized or generalized, and then we can, in addition, describe configuration and arrangement of lesions. Wounds are defined as structural or physiologic disruption of the skin. When an individual acquires a wound, tissue repair responses are activated. Acute wounds heal uneventfully in two to three weeks. If it's a chronic wound, they don't heal and they're often associated with complications. Factors that influence healing. We will mostly discuss factors that negatively influence healing. We should remember that the rate of collagen synthesis and re-epithelialization increases in a moist, crust-free environment. Also, pain is decreased and inflammation is decreased. For those that negatively influence healing, nutritional deficiencies, stress, because stress releases catecholamines causing vasoconstriction. Medications like corticosteroids, chemotherapy, anti-inflammatories. If there's an infection present, that increases the inflammatory response and the destruction of tissue. Also, certain diseases negatively influence healing, like diabetes or anemia. And then there's peripheral vascular disease that reduces the oxygen supply to wounds. General therapeutic management of skin lesions. We apply dressings. We also might apply some topical therapy. Each agent has an active ingredient and it's suspended in a proper vehicle or base. We need to assess the cost and we also need to make sure that the patient or parents have instructions for how to use it properly. Often topical corticosteroids are prescribed. With these we want to apply a thin film and we don't want to use it for more than five to seven days because of the deep pigmentation. Also systemic therapy is available. That could be corticosteroids, antibiotics, or antifungals. So what are the classic signs of wound infection? We all know that it's increased erythema, especially beyond wound margins, edema, purulent exudates, pain, and increased temperature. For wound care basics, parents can generally manage wounds at home. We would instruct them to wash wounds with mild soap and water and the importance of rinsing. We would teach them to avoid povidone iodine, alcohol, and hydrogen peroxide. These items are toxic to cells. 
we would instruct them to cover open wounds and to leave a wide margin of intact skin around the dressing. If leakage occurs, they can remove the dressing, but they should remove it carefully so they don't disrupt healing. For lacerations, they should apply pressure as needed and then assess. Parents need simple written instructions about applying topical medication. We need to tell them how much to use. We might describe it as the amount in the size of a pea or a thin film. The most common complaint with skin lesions is itching or pruritus. It's helpful to use cooling baths or compresses. Burrow solution or plain water is useful to prevent scratching. Mittens are often used for younger children. Nails should be trimmed and kept short. And then the anti-itching medications or the antipyretic medications are helpful. Bacterial infections of the skin can develop into abscess formation. The severity varies with the skin integrity and the immune and cellular defenses that are present. Examples of bacterial infections are impetigo contagiosa, pyoderma, and cellulitis. Impetigo contagiosa is caused by staphylococcus. It begins as a reddish macule and becomes vesicular. It tends to spread peripherally and the exudate dries to form a heavy honey colored crust that you can see in this picture. Topical application of bactericidal agents are effective in severe or extensive cases systemic administration of oral or parenteral antibiotics is appropriate. Cellulitis is caused by streptococcus, staphylococcus, or haemophilus influenza. It may progress to abscess formation and may develop into a systemic infection. The usual treatment is oral or parenteral antibiotics depending on the extent of the infection. Hot and moist compresses are helpful. Rubiola, rubella, and chickenpox all produce characteristic rashes. Some other viral skin infections include Veruca, which is responsible for warts, Herpes simplex types 1 and 2, which is responsible for cold sores, fever blisters, and also genital blisters. Varicella zoster, which is responsible for shingles. And then molluscum contagiosum, which is often seen in school-age children. It resolves on its own in about 18 months. It is transmitted through bathing with other children or direct contact. Dermatophytosis, or fungal infections, are superficial infections that live on the skin. An example is ringworm, which is caused by a group of filamentous fungi. These are transmitted from person to person or from infected animals to humans. Examples include tinea capitis, which are lesions in the scalp that may extend to the hairline or neck, tinea corporis, which spreads peripherally and clears centrally, tinea pedis, which is athlete's foot, and then candidiasis, which grows in moist areas. An example would be diaper dermatitis. You should note that tinea capitis is on the scalp and then the corporis form is on the periphery. Systemic mycotic fungal infections invade the viscera and skin. 
There's a wide spectrum of these diseases. The usual portal of entry is the lungs or the skin, sometimes the mucous membranes. These infections may appear as granulomatous ulcers, plaques, nodules, and abscesses. The common treatment is amphotericin. Some are progressive diseases that are often fatal, some are very serious, and some resolve spontaneously. The common treatment for these infections is amphotericin B. Contact dermatitis is an inflammatory reaction of the skin to chemical substances. The initial reaction takes place in the exposed area. There are characteristic sharp delineations between inflamed skin and normal skin. It's caused by a primary irritant or a sensitizing agent. Examples would be diaper dermatitis, reaction to wool, or reaction to a specific chemical. Poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac. Lesions are caused by the oil in these plants, ferruciol, and that's in the plant's leaves and stems, and that exposure leads to localized lesions. Sensitivity is not inborn, but it may develop after one or two exposures and may change over time. So this oil, ferruciol, penetrates through the epidermis and bonds with the dermal layer. The usual course of healing is 10 to 14 days. You can see the lesions associated with the poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac. You see blisters and tracks of blisters on the skin. Adverse drug reactions are often seen in the skin. Rashes are the most common reaction to drugs. They may be immediate or delayed after administration of a drug. The obvious treatment would be to discontinue the offending drug and then antihistamines may be administered. If the reaction is very severe, they may undergo corticosteroid therapy. There are times when we have to take care of patients with foreign bodies such as splinters of wood or cactus spines. The splinters of wood can be removed with a needle and tweezers. One good trick for removing cactus spines is to use scotch tape or glue. There are also situations where it may be necessary to seek medical treatment. If the foreign body is difficult to see or difficult to remove, examples might be a fish hook or a piece of glass. Arthropod bites and stings. Most arthropods are harmless, but there are certain situations where you should seek medical attention, and this should be immediately. Those examples would be scorpion bites, black widow spider bites, and brown recluse spider bites. For bees, the stinger penetrates the skin. You would want to remove the stinger as soon as possible. Ultimately, sensitization to bee stings may result in anaphylaxis. With the brown recluse spider bites, you can see the effect on the tissue with the spreading of the toxin. Sometimes tissue can become necrotic with the brown recluse spider bite. That's why it's so important to seek medical attention immediately. Scabies is caused by a scabies mite. The female burrows into the epidermis to deposit eggs and feces. Inflammation then occurs 30 to 60 days later. Treatment for scabies includes topical treatment with a scabicide, such as permethrin 5% or lindane. There's also oral treatment, ivermectin, if the body weight is greater than 15 kilograms. Pediculosis capitis, or head lice, is an infestation of the scalp that is common in school-aged children. The adult louse lives only 48 hours 
without a human host. The female louse has the potential to live 30 days. Female lice lay eggs, otherwise called nits, at the base of the hair shaft. These nits hatch in 7 to 10 days. Treatment includes pediculicides and physical removal of the nits, say with a straw. To prevent the spread and recurrence of the pediculosis, we would wash all washable items in the machine, such as clothing, towels, bed linens. This should be done in hot water. They should be dried in a hot dryer for at least 20 minutes. Non-washable items should be dry cleaned. Carpets car seats, pillows, stuffed animals, rugs, mattresses, and upholstery should be thoroughly vacuumed. Non-washable items should be sealed in a plastic bag for 14 days, that is if they cannot be dry cleaned or vacuumed. Combs, brushes, and hair accessories should be soaked in a lice killing product for one hour or in boiling water for 10 minutes. Daycare centers should be aware of the possibility of an outbreak. So children's personal items should be stored in separate cubicles. It would be important to teach individuals not to share items such as hats, scarves, combs, brushes. They should also be t encouraged to avoid physical contact with someone who's been infested with life. Here's a picture of nits on the hair shaft for pediculosis capitis. Rickettsial infections are transmitted by infected fleas, ticks, and mites. An example is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is caused by a tick bite. Also, another tick-borne disorder is Lyme disease that occurs in the United States. In stage one, you would see the erythema migrans, which confirms the diagnosis. There are three stages of the disease. The second is the most severe. It affects the cardiovascular system, the neurological system, and the musculoskeletal system. It's important that Lyme disease be caught in the first stage or diagnosed in the first stage. The third stage affects the joints, and the individual also may have deafness, and chronic encephalopathy. The focus is on prevention. Prevention includes avoiding areas where ticks are prevalent, inspecting the skin for ticks, especially after the child or the adult has been in a wooded area. The use of insect repellents containing D has been recommended, but it has to be used with caution. It should never be applied to a child's face, hands, or an area where skin is irritated. And check for ticks. Those checks should be focused on areas like the scalp, neck, armpits, and groin areas. Here is the erythema migrans that is associated with Lyme disease. Bites from pets and wild animals are common pediatric problems. The majority of victims of dog bites are boys between the ages of 5 and 9 years. Wound care is important. The wound should be irrigated with copious amounts of saline or lactated ringer, and then the surrounding skin should be washed with mild soap. Prophylactic antibiotics may be given, and there's also a concern about rabies or tetanus. So medical attention should be sought. To avoid animal bites, children should be taught to avoid all strange animals as well as dangerous and nervous animals. They should be taught the danger of mistreating or teasing pets. They should avoid direct eye contact with a threatening dog and they should never hold their face close to an animal. Children should be taught not to disturb an animal that is eating, sleeping, caring for young ones, like puppies or kittens. 
and then also they should be taught not to sneak up on an animal. Human bites occur during rough play, during fights, and also it may be a result of child abuse. There's a definite risk of infection, so wound care is important. These wounds can be treated at home if the wound is less than one-fourth inch in length. So the wound should be irrigated, washed vigorously with soap and water. Ice could be applied. If they're not current with their tetanus immunization, then they would need to seek medical attention. For cat scratch disease, this is the most common cause of regional lymphadenitis. It follows the scratch or a bite of an animal. 99% of the cases are the result of a scratch or a bite from a cat or a kitten. This is a benign condition that is self-limiting. It usually resolves in two to four months the treatment is supportive and it includes antibiotic therapy. Diaper dermatitis is usually caused by irritation from urine and feces or detergents that are inadequately rinsed from the diaper or clothing. Also, it could be from chemical irritation, especially, say, from diaper wipes. Nursing considerations would be to alter those three major factors, such as wetness, pH and fecal irritants. So it's important to keep the skin dry. That can be done by using super absorbent disposable diapers and changing the diapers as soon as they are soiled. Also, the nurse could expose healthy or only slightly irritated skin to air so that it dries completely. Ointment can be applied such as zinc, ox zinc oxide or petrolatum. The parent or the nurse should avoid removing skin barrier cream with each diaper change because that can be irritating. Avoid overwashing the skin, especially with those perfumed soaps or commercial wipes. A moisturizer or a non-soap cleanser could be used. Stool should be wiped gently away and that can be with water, mild soap, Dove is a good example. Here is an example of diaper dermatitis. Here is candidiasis of the diaper area. Atopic dermatitis, otherwise known as eczema, is a type of pruritic eczema that begins during infancy. It has a hereditary tendency. It's often associated with food allergies, allergic rhinitis, and asthma. To prevent atopic dermatitis, it would be important to identify children at risk, those with a family history, those with dry flaky skin. Also, prenatal precautions can be taken during the last trimester and that would be to avoid food allergens, avoid things that are common allergens like milk, dairy products, peanuts, and eggs. During the postnatal period, breastfed babies have fewer atopic reactions. Avoiding solid food for the first six months, no cow's milk or soy formula, no eggs, fish, corn, citrus, peanuts, nuts or chocolate for 12 to 18 months. And new foods should be added at five to seven day intervals to identify reactions. Here's a picture of atopic dermatitis. There are three forms of atopic dermatitis. There's infantile eczema, which is generalized and especially on the cheek, scalp, trunk, and extensor surfaces of the extremity. The childhood form is in the flexural areas like the antecubital space, popliteal fossa, neck, wrists, ankles, and feet. The preadolescent and adolescent form occurs on the face, the sides of the neck, hands, feet, and antecubital and popliteal fossa to a lesser extent. 
The infantile eczema begins at two to six months of age and usually goes into remission by age three. Childhood eczema occurs at two to three years of age and the pre-adolescent and adolescent eczema occurs at 12 years of age and continues to early adulthood or even throughout life. Therapeutic management of atopic dermatitis includes hydrating the skin, relieving the pruritus, reducing the inflammation, and preventing and controlling secondary infections. To accomplish this through nursing care, the nurse would use mild detergent for laundering, bedding, and clothing, or the family would do this. Prevent scratching to avoid infection. Use wet soaks and compresses as ordered. Trim the fingernails short and file sharp edges of the fingernails. And then they should also wear soft cotton fabric. Seborrheic dermatitis is a chronic recurrent inflammatory reaction of the skin. The cause is unknown. It commonly occurs on the scalp, also called cradle cap. It also can be seen on eyelids nasolabial folds, ears, and in the inguinal region. Treatment involves removing the crust and using antiseborrheic shampoo. Acne vulgaris predominantly occurs in adolescents and in 50% of teenagers. The pathophysiology involves hair follicles and sebaceous glands. Comatogenesis is the formation of whiteheads and blackheads. Therapeutic management includes general measures such as adequate rest, moderate exercise, a well-balanced diet, reduction of emotional stress, and elimination of sources of infection. Retin-A has been used to effectively treat acne vulgaris. It should not be applied for at least 20 to 30 minutes after washing to decrease the burning sensation. The avoidance of the sun and the daily use of sunscreen must be emphasized. Topical antibacterial agents are also used to treat acne vulgaris. Here are two examples of acne. Thermal injuries or burns occur in children of all ages. With toddlers, it's often hot water scalds. With older children, it would be flame-related burns. Burns can also result from child abuse. Some burns also occur as a result of children playing with matches or lighters. These burns account for one out of 10 house fires. The same characteristics of burn injury apply that you learned in med surge. A first degree burn is superficial. A second degree burn is partial thickness. A third degree burn is full thickness. A fourth degree burn is full thickness plus affected underlying tissue. The extent of the injury is described in terms of the total body surface area and there are age related charts. The severity of the injury can be classified as minor, moderate, and major, and this helps with the disposition of the patient. Here are the pediatric body surface area burn charts. Notice that they are definitely different from the adult. This chart includes the characteristics of the different severities of burns. This would be examples of superficial partial thickness burns. Notice the blisters. This patient's burn injuries have multiple burn depths.
This is an example of a full thickness burn. When we look at the severity of burn injuries, we should remember that major burn injuries should be treated in a specialized burn center. Moderate burn injuries could be treated in a hospital where there are experts in burn treatment. And then a minor burn injury can be treated in an outpatient setting. There are different types of burn injuries. They can be caused by thermal agents, which would be a flame, hot surfaces, hot liquids. There could be electrical injuries, which involves an electrical current. And then there are chemical burns, which could be inhalation or ingestion of toxic substances. Pathophysiology of burn injuries. There are systemic responses that involve capillary permeability, edema, hypovolemia, and anemia also occur. As you remember from med surge, there are many complications of burn injuries. There can be an immediate threat to the airway, profound shock, infection, which can be local or systemic. Respiratory problems could include inhalation injuries, aspiration, pulmonary edema, and pulmonary embolus. For therapeutic management of burn injuries, there are some immediate emergency care priorities. First thing is to stop the burning process. Then assess the child's condition, cover the burn to prevent contamination, transport the child to an appropriate level of care, and above all, provide reassurance. For therapeutic management of burn injuries, as you know, the first priority is airway maintenance. Fluid replacement therapy is also important and critical in the first 24 hours. Nutrition is important because of the enhanced metabolic demands. Medications are also administered such as antibiotics, analgesics, and anesthetics for procedural pain. For wound management, there may be primary excision as well as debridement. Topical antimicrobial agents may be applied, as well as biologic skin coverings, such as allografts, xenografts, synthetic skin substitutes, and also split thickness skin grafts. This dermatome is used to remove the split thickness skin graft. This is a sheet graft that has been placed on a burned hand. This is a mesh graft that has been placed on a burned hand. Wound cleansing, debridement, and appropriate dressings are important when caring for minor burns. Removal of blisters is controversial, as well as use of ointments and occlusive dressings. That's why it's important to use evidence-based practice as you care for these pediatric patients. Long-term care begins once wound coverage has been achieved. Long-term care involves prevention and management of contractures, physical and occupational therapy, the use of a multidisciplinary team, facilitation of the adaptation of the child and the family, and also prevention of burn injury. Ultraviolet A waves are the longest and cause only minimum burning. They do play a significant role in photosensitive and photoallergic reactions. They are also responsible for premature aging of the skin and potentiate the effect of ultraviolet B waves. Ultraviolet B waves are shorter they are responsible for tanning, burning, and most of the harmful effects that are attributed to sunlight, especially skin cancer. It's important to protect the skin through the use of sunscreen. The amount of ultraviolet exposure is influenced by numerous factors, 
it could be the time of day. The highest would be between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Higher altitude, nearness to the equator. Also, the reflection off of snow, sand, and water. Cold injury. Chilblain is a redness or swelling, especially of the hands when exposed. It involves vasodilation, edema, bluish patches, itching and burning. The symptoms continue after rewarming, but they usually resolve in a few days. With frostbite, the tissue damage is caused by ice crystals in the tissue. Blisters appear 24 to 48 hours after rewarming. The treatment of the blisters is similar to burn treatment. Rapid rewarming is important because it's associated with less tissue necrosis. Slow thawing would lead to more tissue necrosis.